but my corner for my untrained person is 50 to 60 percent VO2 max. My corner for someone who's aerobically trained is going to be anywhere from 65 to 80, 85 percent of VO2 max. All right. So what that means, this change in the lactate threshold here, what that represents is the ability to work much harder or much longer before I have to start accessing carbohydrate. Okay? So lactate threshold then is considered to represent the race pace or the intensity that I can maintain over time. Right? As long as I stay to the left of the corner, I can keep going and going and going and going. Right? Once I go around the corner, I'm on the slippery slope towards fatigue because now I've got hydrogen ions and all kinds of stuff flooding out that are going to make the enzymes not want to work very effectively. Right. So there's a significant correlation between endurance performance and the point at which this corner occurs, lactate threshold. Now in some sports, so running, swimming, do you guys use lactate threshold as a training zone? Sometimes. So in running, swimming, um, some cycling, they'll use lactate threshold as the training zone, like we talked about for um, percentage heart rate max and percentage VO2 max in lab. They'll set the training program at above lactate threshold, below lactate threshold, or neutral at lactate threshold. So if I'm doing if I'm doing sets of sprint type work that is above lactate threshold, then I'm going to be training glycolysis and I'm going to be getting fatigued quite quickly. If I'm doing sets that are below lactate threshold, then I'm able to go for longer periods of time and I don't get so tired. So it depends on what the goal for the training program for that day is. And again, I've never used lactate threshold as the intensity measure because that's not the sport I was ever involved with. But I've seen programs for runners and swimmers that, that mention this idea. Okay? What else do you need to know there? I think that's it for the minute. Right, so the key here is not the number. Right? I mean the num if you're good with numbers and you can remember the numbers, that's good. Right? The key is that the less trained I am, the further to the left the lactate threshold is, the more aerobically trained I am, we see a shift to the right, and that gives me more time before I start fatiguing. if I'm a sprinter that uses that energy system. Okay. When we got to glycolysis, we had a similar picture, an increase in glycolytic enzymes and their activity level, and an increase in stored substrate, this time carbohydrate in the form of gly glycogen. <coughs> okay. And then in glycolysis in system two, we added a third adaptation, which was the buffering system. 
right? That the more I train that system, the more buffers we find within the cell to try to balance out the pH for a little bit longer before fatigue starts. So, we get to system three. Not surprisingly, the first two adaptations are very similar, just for system three, right? We see an increase in aerobic enzyme number and in their activity, right? And we'll come back when we look at the muscles, we'll come back and talk about the fact that some of that increase is due to the fact that when I train a muscle aerobically, it develops more mitochondria. Remember that mitochondria is where system three occurs, right? So, if I've got more mitochondria available, then I've got more enzymes available to make ATP aerobically. Why would there be less aerobic enzyme increase for short-term sprints? this hand, this bicep to get stronger and bigger? No, because I'm not training it, right? So if I'm doing short-term sprints, I'm not training aerobic metabolism. So we don't see, unless the rest periods are very, very short, if you're doing some kind of hit or you're doing some kind of um, um, you know, short sprint, very quick rest, short sprint, very quick rest, and that rest is really, really short, you might hit some aerobic metabolism, but not much. As with the other two systems, we also see increased substrate availability. So the more aerobically trained I am, the higher the levels of glycogen in the muscle. And we also see an increase in triglycerides stored directly in the muscle tissue so that I don't have to break them down and transport the fatty acids through the bloodstream. Because that all takes time, right? If I can break them right down inside the muscle tissue, then they're right there available for me straight away. Okay? Still takes a long time to get to them because they're such big molecules but I don't have to transport them around the body. Right. So we also see an increase in substrate use, improved substrate use. So what happens is that we become um, better at metabolizing glycogen and triglycerides, so we get a little faster at that. So someone who trains, we talked about that crossover on Monday, wait, today's Monday, Friday, right? We said that the crossover when we're looking at duration is around 20 minutes. If I'm a highly trained endurance athlete, that crossover could be a little bit earlier than 20 minutes. Not mass is earlier, it's not like the crossover is going to be at 5 minutes. But given the amount of ATP I can get from a fat, even if that crossover is three or four minutes earlier, mm -hmm. that gives me a big benefit for, for energy availability in a race. Right? So that improved substrate efficiency can benefit me because I'm able to get to the fat sooner and that gives me much more ATP. Right. We also see that people who train aerobically 
use their fat a little bit more than someone who's untrained, right? That's great because that means I don't have to use my glycogen stores, and that means that I don't hit fatigue so soon, okay? So what happens when we do a race, right? Long distance race, okay? So, for the first 30 seconds, remember we're going to use system one. So we're going to kind of ignore the first 30 seconds or so. Because we know we have to use system one to get going. Right? Then, we're going to start using carbohydrate. And for two and a half minutes, that carbohydrate is going to be glycolysis. And I'm simplifying this. Remember that we did say that all these systems overlap most of the time. Okay, so I'm really simplifying this. After three minutes, we're looking at oxidative phosphorylation. Okay. Until around 20 minutes. This is my crossover. And then I'm going to use fats. Until such time as either I've been working so hard for so long, like five and a half hours and I'm still not at the finish line, okay? I'm working really hard, okay? So then I would go back to carbohydrate. Or if I'm a trained runner and I'm an elite runner, at some point I'm gonna wanna sprint and I'm gonna want to increase my intensity to the finish line to make sure that I at least make my personal best or I beat that or I get in front of the guy that's hanging on my shoulder, right? So we switch back to our carbs. Okay? This is the point at which Glycogen loading and having lots of stored glycogen or not having used all your glycogen up this side of the picture is beneficial. Because here, this is where people report what they call hitting the wall. Right? Hitting the wall occurs when you try to go back to carbohydrate and there ain't any there. Right? So you start sprinting, and then your legs start wobbling, right? So you may have seen pictures of people who finish a marathon and literally fall flat on their face as they take half a step over the line, right? So they're coming up to the line, and they're doing all they want to do is finish that line. And they get a step over the line, and they fall flat on their face. That's hitting the wall. That is complete glycogen depletion. Right? When you watch the elite runners, we don't see this very much anymore. Because in the past 15 years or so, we've learned a lot about glycogen storage and how to glycogen load appropriately so that I've got piles of glycogen available. Plus, we're training them to switch to fats earlier, so they may be switching down here. That saves a chunk of glycogen for over here, right? So an elite runner, unless they completely miss time their sprint and their spurts and things like that, or they skip a feeding station in the race, right, because they have to stop and grab a drink or a jelly cube, 
right, whichever version they're using of carbohydrate for them in the race. Long distance swimmers, they have these little jelly tubes in little paper cups, right, and they'll swim and they'll grab it off the tray and chuck it and keep swimming. Right? If you watch a running marathon, they'll run over, grab a glass, keep running, chuck it down. Right? That's carbohydrate and water. Right? So if they do their job properly, we don't see elite athletes hitting the wall anymore. Because we know too much about it now. But the rest of us... <laughs> When I, do, when I did the race the other Saturday, I had um, raisins in my pocket. And so every 15 minutes, I would slow down, grab a chuck raisins in to make sure I took some water. Because the first year I went, I didn't do that. Oh my god. Very, very, very ugly. Right? So you learn. It's like, oh, I knew better than to try to get through the whole race without eating the raisins I had in my backpack because I didn't want to stop, take my backpack off, get the raisins, put it back on, right? So I just tried to do it without. Big boo boo. Then we've already mentioned another adaptation that we see. <coughs> Uh, number five is that the lactate threshold shifts to the right. Okay, so we have longer in terms of how hard I can run before I start to fatigue. And then we'll come back to this idea when we're looking at aerobic metabolism as a whole, we have to take into account the changes that are occurring within the muscular and the cardiovascular system as well, because they directly impact aerobic metabolism. So we've got these five that occur within the system per se, but then we've got a couple more adaptations that facilitate aerobic metabolism when we start looking at I said, the muscular system and the cardiovascular system. Questions? Good? One more thing. Alright. One more. Well, two, but the second one's simple. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Uh, you know, you like hear like those army guys like talk about, you know, they like they just keep going and call mental. Like once you run out, are you done? Like, you, you are done. Like, you can't like mentally make it. You can't. Yeah. You can't. Because the, mus the muscle is done. So, um, you could crawl, right? Like where's where's my oh, 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 yeah. Right? Like um, Martin Luther King said, you know, if you can't run, walk, if you can't walk, crawl. Right? And so part of their training is to just make them keep going. It doesn't matter how you keep going. Right? And that's where the mental thing comes in. Um, but no, you can't you can't make muscles contract without like a chill or no. I guess when they say that it's probably just mostly mental because they're so sleep deprived that mentally it's up to them to keep going or physically they do this they And probably if, if the person in charge of those types of training sessions is, knows what they're doing, they're running them below that, like they're running them right at that lactate threshold, so that they don't go around into true fatigue, and so what you're battling is what's going on in here. I suspect. I don't know. I, you know, I mean, there's no other way you could do it. So that, you know, I mean, they don't have them sprinting, right? They have them just chugging along with 900 million pounds on their back. Okay.
All right, so think about your own training, okay? We've said that we use oxygen to make ATP when we're moving, right? So you jog on the treadmill or you run around the field out here or whatever you're doing, right? Or you run heel sprints, okay? And then you stop. What happens to your breathing when you stop? Right. But I'm not doing any work. Are you sitting here, not doing any work, going, <sighs> hopefully not, <laughs> because we have to call the ambulance. Right? So what's the difference between not doing any work at the end of a training bout and not doing any work when you're sitting at your desk? This is what we want to look at because it's really, really fascinating, okay? So when we finish exercising, it takes a period of time for our body to normalize, to get back to what we call homeostasis, okay? But that really just means to get back close to resting state, right? And during that time, Heart rate stays elevated for a while, so if you wear a heart rate monitor, you can watch your recovery heart rate, right? How long does it take when you finish the training for your heart rate to come all the way back down to 68 or so, okay? That's called recovery heart rate. Well, we see a similar thing with breathing, right? So I continue to breathe way more than I need for standing still, okay? That's called epoch, okay? Again, like with our friends NAD and FAD and all the other stuff, I would stick with epoch because you can always look up what that means because excess post-oxygen consumption is a bit of a mouthful, right? Epoch is a lot easier. This is what it looks like. So, on here we have, on the y-axis, we have oxygen consumption. Remember that oxygen consumption isn't how much oxygen I'm breathing, it's how much oxygen is being used by the tissues, right? So, oxygen consumption versus on the x-axis time. So the bottom dotted line here is rest. So I'm sitting, listening to Dr. Wall whittering on, right? This is how much oxygen I need to fuel heart contraction, lungs, digestion, postural muscles, keep me warm, right? And then the end of the lesson comes, I have to stand up and I've got to get out of the building, over the bridge and over to the library for a study session. Right? So that immediate increase in intensity technically would require this much oxygen if I was going to fuel it aerobically but we know we can't fuel it aerobically initially, we've got to go for three minutes anaerobically. Okay? So what we get in oxygen consumption is over those three minutes to five minutes or so, we see an increase in oxygen consumption, but we get what we call the oxygen deficit. This is what I needed to make ATP to do that first initial bit of work, but I didn't have it, right? So that shaded area is the oxygen deficit. Once I get up to here, then assuming I maintain the intensity level, so I don't suddenly decide I've got to run up the stairs in the library to get up 
top, I just walk up the stairs, right? Then this is called steady state. And in steady state, oxygen consumption flatlines because that means that I am providing enough oxygen for the level of work that I'm working in. Right? So my oxygen doesn't need to keep going up. Right? It's just going to flatline there for a while until I stop. Think about, again, if you ever do run or walk or bike or swim long distances, think about that initial start to the exercise, right? The first few minutes are quite uncomfortable, okay? Maybe for some of us, the first five minutes are quite uncomfortable. And then all of a sudden, without you even realizing it, you realize that it feels a bit easier now, right? Those first five minutes are this. The point at which you suddenly go, oh, this doesn't feel so bad now, is here. So, then what happens at the end of exercise? So, I get to the library, I find my friends, I plop my bag down, I sit down. For some time, until my breathing rate gets back to the amount of oxygen I need to sit down with my friends. So, in, when I was your age, and I was an undergrad, this part of the curve matched this part of the curve. They were exactly the same size. Right? So this is oxygen deficit, this was called oxygen debt. And what we thought was that the extra breathing we were doing was just to pay back what we needed at the beginning. In the 20 odd years between me being an undergraduate and me going to graduate school, <laughs> the picture changed as we learned some more information. Okay. Now we know that EPOC, this area under the curve of the amount of oxygen I need to get back to rest, is a lot larger than oxygen deficit was. Right? So, that's another one of those red flags you can look out for in textbooks or articles or on blogs and things. Although our textbook mentions this term, they call this epoch. Because oxygen debt, as I said, oxygen debt is slightly different because that's an out-of-date version of this. Right? So if someone's talking about oxygen debts and they're not calling it EPOC, you want to just double check that reference. They may be out of date. Okay. So what's going on here then? Why do we need so much more oxygen when we finish the exercise? Why does it take so long? Right? So there's, when you look in, if you look on page 64, of your textbook, the figure on the left, figure 3.10, shows you the variables that we currently think are playing a role in why EPOC occurs the way it does. Okay. They now cleverly have decided to divide EPOC into two sections. This first bit here is called the rapid phase. And you'll see the graph drops very quickly here. So it lasts about two to three minutes. And what they think is occurring during the rapid phase is that that is when the majority of phosphocreatine is resynthesized within the muscle cell. Right? So remember here, we would have broken down a lot of ATP and phosphocreatine to get going. This is when we rebuild that phosphocreatine so that when I get to leave the library, I'm ready to go. 
After three minutes, the rest of this, you can see that the slope of the curve is less steep. This is called the slow phase. And that can last up to several hours. And during this part of the walk, <coughs> they think that we are metabolizing um, any lactate that is left within the muscle cell or in the bloodstream. So we're moving that around and reconverting it to glucose. We are restoring oxygen levels on hemoglobin and within the muscle cell on myoglobin, which we haven't talked about yet, but we'll come to in later chapters. Plus, we've got still an increase in body temperature, which means we've got extra hormones and we've got all the catecholamines to deal with that were released during the exercise session and all that takes more ATP and to get that ATP I need oxygen. Okay. So to re-establish body temperature, to clear out cortisol and epinephrine, all of that takes ATP. So I have to metabolize ATP aerobically during the session. <coughs> what they found is that the intensity of the exercise bout is more important than the duration of the exercise bout for how much EPOC is occurring. Right? So this is fascinating to me and it wasn't honestly Honestly, honestly, it wasn't until I had taught this class through the second year that I really got a handle on it. Because it had always, always bugged me and I didn't understand it until I really understood what was happening here. If I walk out to the staircase, right, and I run up the staircase, that takes me... I mean, I'm slow, but I still probably do it in eight or ten seconds. Which energy system am I using? Anaerobic, ATPPC. Why, when I get to the top of the stairs, am I going, <laughs> right? If I wasn't working aerobically. Because if I run up those stairs as fast as I can run, right, then I need a lot of oxygen to metabolize ATP and aerobically to fix all the wreck I made running up the stairs in 10 seconds. so you are not producing an excess amount of hydrogen ions because they're all getting picked up and shuttled across to the electron transport chain. I'm making ATP continuously as long as I'm providing oxygen to the muscle cell. So you can you can keep going for hours. Yeah, this area? Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you are just run up the stairs and stop, this area doesn't exist, and this curve fits straight on the end of here. Okay. So we've done all the work. We're exhausted. It's time to recover. All right. What's the best way? to recover because recovery is really crucial for continued training and improvement in performance. All right? If I don't find a way to recover properly from a hard training session on day one, training session on day two is not very good. Right? And that's just all there is to it. It's why when, if we're doing a very heavy weightlifting routine, 
we don't do legs two days in a row, right? If we, if we split out <coughs> weight training and we're not doing a whole body routine, I don't do legs on Monday and legs on Tuesday because I knackered legs on Monday. Tuesday I'm going to fall on my face if I try and do legs. So Tuesday I do back, right? Same with running or with any aerobic work. If I train really, really hard on day one, I can't expect to train really, really hard on day two, especially if I didn't maximize my recovery period. So, one of the things we have to deal with is this blood lactate situation, right? I want to move this blood lactate out of the bloodstream and I want to drop it into core recycle and recycle it into glucose or other products. Right? So the best way to do that is to do some kind of active recovery phase. So what some of us would call the cool down maybe. Right? It's not something we're very good at generally. Is it? We're really good at warming up. Right? Not many of us go and train hard without at least doing a little bit of stretching or something. But when we get to the end of the session, we're like, oh God, I've got to get the class, okay, throw my clothes on, go, and we don't cool down afterwards. Okay. So active recovery, some kind of light level, low intensity level aerobic work is important, much more effective than just standing still or sitting down. As long as the work that you're doing in the active recovery is below your lactate threshold, otherwise you're exacerbating the problem. Right? So, if I'm sprinting, I jog. If I'm jogging or I'm moving quite quickly but I'm not sprinting all out, maybe I walk for a little while. Or I get on the stationary bike and I bike for a little bit. Right? So, again, it depends on the sport, depends on the reason for the recovery, because the other, the contradiction almost that we have is that if what I do is sit down or stand still, we see faster glycogen resynthesis within the muscle. Right? So, we've got a lot to learn about this recovery phase here. Um, what's the best way to do it, under which circumstances, right? Lactate recovery doesn't matter how trained you are, right? The research says there aren't really any differences in this recovery period between someone who's not trained and someone who is trained, which I find really interesting because wouldn't you think that a good adaptation would be improved recovery from the exercise bout, right? So it'll be interesting to see the next version of textbooks and, and articles to see whether or not they find out that actually if you're a trained athlete, your recovery is different, right? Um, and I'm not sure if I have, oh yes. So this is look at, looking at removing lactate from the bloodstream, okay? If, here's my end of my exercise. If I do a passive recovery, so there's a period of time when I stop finishing where there's still lactate being dumped into the bloodstream from the muscle tissue, and then we start to see a drop in blood lactate as it gets removed from the bloodstream. If I do a passive, um, sorry, an active recovery, then we see this drop much sooner. But as I said, in my opinion, we've got piles more to learn about recovery because it's so crucial, especially when you're like the soccer guys or the basketball, where you have to compete days in a row, right?
review on Wednesday. Right? So, for the review, if we have big questions, anything you want me to go over and, and revisit, we will do those first. Then, I have a set of questions and things from your textbook for you to work through to kind of hone in on bits of information. All right? Then I will put all the answers up on Blackboard for all the questions at the end of the chapter. Okay? And then Friday is exam. If you cannot make Friday sick on a trip, at the vet, whatever. <laughs> I have to know before Friday. Right? I mean, obviously, if you wake up sick on Friday, you can't let me know before Friday, but let me know. And then we can rearrange for you to take an exam next week. Right? I don't care when you take the exam as long as you take the exam. Right? If you get to Thursday lunchtime and you're like, oh crap, I can't go with this by tomorrow. Email me. I need an extension to Monday, please. I'd rather you did a good job in the exam. That's the point, right? The exam isn't supposed to freak everybody out. The exam is supposed to let me know what you do and don't understand. So you need to be able to do your best effort on revising and studying and learning, not memorizing. Don't memorize, I'm warning you now, do not rote memorize, it doesn't work, right? Learn, understand the concepts. Okay? If you need a little bit longer for that, some people need a little bit longer, that's okay. All right? Okay.